you know, we're harassing them or we're giving them a hard time. One guy you advocated for threatened to kill a librarian and is in jail right now. Well, he's mentally ill, that guy. Okay, but yeah. he's and a my good... My librarians are scared to death. He's a good example of somebody you advocated hard for every time we came out. And he was a problem. And we, tr trust me, sir, we tried to get him to go home to his family, mm -hmm. and he didn't know anything else but the parks. That's where he wanted to be. Well, it's not okay when you start threatening people. Now he's in jail. Now he faces a stay-away order from the park. These are extremes, in my opinion, stuff that we never should have had to go to. Now we're telling people that are being arrested, hey, by the way, well, the judges, not us, you can't go to that park for the next three or four years because you're on probation, and if you do, you go to jail. So it's a very complex issue that we, we it's, it's like walking on eggshells. We're not out there to harass people. Trust me, the West Sea, we have so many other things that we can address <laughs> and, and deal with. It's not, but it's like the complaints that come in and all the problems that come in. And, and, and these residents last night, that meeting was just, okay. it really was. They're really just, happy to be here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was, and, and I, you know, he brings up a very good point about if, if this meeting was go a totally different direction if you had residents and business owners here. And I say that because they wouldn't give you two seconds to talk. They would tell you, it's wrong, I don't care what you think, we're done with it. We fit off on, um, we don't get to do that. That's not our job. We have to police, and we've got to enforce laws, and we got to protect people's civil rights, but when somebody's in violation, we have no choice but to do something well, about it. I understand it. it. So hey, I'm, I'm asking that. Let, let me, let me uh, so Can I ask a question, though, before you? You know, uh, in regards to James, um, the gentleman, mm -hmm. like I know him, and I've talked to him. The guy has a mental capacity of a 12 year old. What do we do? I mean, I, I, I work with homeless people all the time. There is no solution for it. There's a lot of people that are not criminally insane, so you can forcefully put them away. They're stuck in the middle. But they're kind of stuck in the middle. I mean, I felt so bad for that kid because he's not hes not there. If you actually you know, have a conversation with him, he, he's like a 12-year-old in a man's body. Just like you have that question and you can't answer it, yeah. Yeah. we have that question and we can't answer it. I can tell you that from the housing perspective, because like we've given people that have vouchers and people think that that's the answer and they end up being kicked out because of that same situation. Mental health is a very difficult situation and it's not a situation where you can force somebody to sure. get help. We have somebody right now who has a voucher. We know he's on the streets. We have found him eight different places, but every time he shows up, we've talked and said, we're sending you somebody, we're paying their rent, but they get there and the mental health becomes the barrier. We referred him to his mental health um, services agency, asked him, please link up, please stay linked to them so that you can get yourself stable enough so that we can get you into housing. We've been working on it for six months. Well, the other issue with the housing for the mentally ill too is even if they do get, uh, so like our, our pro team or our clinician says this person needs to be 72 hour because they're danger to themselves, gravely disabled, whatever. After that process, runs its course, and if the doctor says, hey, they're still, after the 72 hours, they're not, I can't release them, there's only 40 beds um, in the county to, to, to house all of them that, that aren't private insurance. I'm talking about 400 people. 40 in the whole county. So we all know there's more than 40 people that, that can't be released that need to stay in a mental health hospital for a while. There's 40 beds. So. And, and th th this is my thing with James. Um, <coughs> since he's, like he said, he's actually, he's got like a 12 year old mentality. So, of course, 12 year olds all the time say, I'm going to kill you. But do they kill anybody? No. He didn't kill anybody. I mean, he says all kinds of stupid stuff. But it's against the law. It's against the law. I don't know. Can, can, can I finish, please? And I know that that's against the law. It's a terrorist threat, essentially, when you threaten to kill somebody. Yes. But, but he's like a 12 year old. And, and to prosecute somebody as a, an adult, that acts like it and thinks like a 12-year-old, it's not legal, from what I understand. If, if someone has a true mental illness, you can't treat them like someone that doesn't have a mental illness. Okay. You can prosecute them the same. But that's he, not for the PD Yeah, that's side. for the courts. And yeah. The, yeah, but the, 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 the CA officer. Yeah, 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 exactly. And this, this is the problem is, is I see James being treated like that because he's, I believe, from what I understand, still in jail to this time and has a court date coming up. But a long time ago, the police, myself, and others have all recognized this guy has a mentality of a 12-year-old. And, and there was nothing really done to, uh, as, far, as far as getting into mental health. The, the, I, I guess uh, the police should, should uh, they already knew that about him. So, so to, to criminalize him in such a way as someone that doesn't have a mental illness and put him away in jail, uh, and then he's in danger there because
because you know people in jail, from what I understand, they, they kicked his hey, butt. So what I don't mean to like, cut you off on this again, but there you came into this when there is a history with Mr. Sanderson mm -hmm. and stuff you're not aware of, and we're not privy to give to you. And the reason I bring that up is because you only see what you see, and you have your camera out, and it's never. It's never, it's always like what we're doing wrong. Every, every interaction that I've seen or seen you out there, it's always what we're doing wrong. And when there's a problem or they're doing something, they're doing something wrong, clearly illegal, there's no filming of that, sir. You don't film that. You just film our well, reaction to it. Actually, yeah. And I'll give you credit. You actually helped in a case where one of the homeless people was assaulted. Mm -hmm. Good job. You absolutely did. You filmed it. He got punched in the face. Everybody's like, that's a great video. That's going to stand up in court. Good stuff. That's advocating for them. But we're out there doing a job. We're not mistreating them, yeah. but we're doing what we're doing as police. So Mr. Sanderson and other people maybe that you advocate for have histories and they have contacts with us that you may not be aware of. And you may only know what you see. There's more to every single person out there, especially if they're there long before you're there. So my point is, is that it's okay for you to say, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I want to advocate for this guy, but I'm asking that you kind of do your homework and know all the facts. And how you would do that, I don't know. But we're not out there picking on people. There's a reason we're contacting them. And I don't need to get into his, his case specific because I don't have all the details. But I'm just asking that if you advocate, you advocate fully, not just on, on picking and choosing stuff because we really truly are trying very hard. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to attack, like I said, a lot of officers I see do a good job, but I say that publicly, you know, and I make mention of that. So I'm not saying every police officer is doing evil, you know, but, but I think that the, when the officers I see, they realize someone has a mental illness, but then he's being treated like someone that doesn't. That's, that's what I have a problem with. So it doesn't make sense. So I'm not fully familiar with this case, in fact, not really, only from what I heard from you guys right now, but quickly. So let's say you had somebody that, that had a mental capacity of a 12 year old mm -hmm. and homeless, he's out there, and we've tried outreach. Hey, you know what? Uh, we had the mental health clinician come out, try to offer services. He doesn't want him. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Talks kind of crazy at times, but not, not gravely disabled, right? He's able to eat and mm -hmm. he's sustaining himself out there. At the time, not a danger to others, right? Because maybe he hasn't threatened to kill anybody. I didn't chase anybody with a knife. Uh, and I'm not suicidal. Those are the three things where we could take somebody that has mental illness and take them against their will and get them in to help. Gravely disabled, danger to themselves, danger to others. Doesn't meet those criteria. Mental capacity for a 12-year-old, but he could do the life-sustaining stuff. Crazy, saying crazy stuff, but that's not a crime. Not a crime to be mentally ill. It's not. So... You're limited as to what you can do. You can try the outreach stuff, doesn't want it. Now, all of a sudden, up to Annie. Now, and I don't know the circumstances, but let's say he goes into the library, I'm gonna kill you, because he tells me whatever. He starts making those threats. Librarians are scared to death. I don't know this guy. I read on the news that people come in all the time and cut people up and shoot people. I'm scared. Mm -hmm. This guy's threatening to kill me. Sure. Calls the police. What do we do? Yeah. Hands are tied. We gotta now yeah. tr take him in the criminal justice system. Hopefully, what you said happens, the DA looks at it, says this guy, his defense yeah, attorney yeah. gets him, goes, this guy's not right. I want an assessment done, and he gets help that way. But our tool is take him, commit a crime, mm -hmm. get him in the system that way. Because there's nothing else we can do. You said the key point there. You know what I mean? It's, it's, the, the, the options are very limited. Yeah, right? it, Your options are extremely we got people that are scared to death, don't know yeah. him. I, you know, I'd sure. be scared too. Someone say, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess my question is, I mean, I wish there was someone else that they could take them, like a mental health facility instead of jail. There would be. But but the only way we could do that is danger to themselves, danger to others, gravely. To, you know, it, those are the only way that we could take somebody because it's constitution, right? The government can't come take somebody and say, "I'm going to force you because I," you know, we can't do it. Nor should we. I would never advocate for that. I mean, yeah. our clinician, she'll take people even when there's even like a question of it because. She's targeting to try and get these people off the street. Yeah. But even then, we have a fine criteria to follow. She can sway that a little bit because she's in mental health. But we're still, I mean, we, those resources out every day during the week. That resource is out every day. Mm -hmm. And they're constantly being called by patrol because the problem's not just in the parks, obviously. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. So they're called all over the city. Yeah. And they do what they can. Some people go. Some people don't. But some sort of resource is offered at the time. Mm -hmm. So... Like, I think we're, like, as a city, we are doing great. We're throwing everything we possibly can at it. 
if we had a hundred more cops, things would be different. Yeah, you know? I, I, I'm not saying I, I believe that there are officers out there doing good things. Absolutely, so I don't. I don't I'm not here to say other. So your you first, your three, first three, uh, or two or three uh, shares were about positive interactions with yeah. the police officers. Yeah, and, and I too, and I've never, I've had one traffic ticket in my whole life, and and that's my only involvement with law enforcement. But I've been frisked, I've been stopped, I've been questioned. Um, I've been, I've dealt with police officers that were incredible, and I've dealt with police officers that were jerks. I used an analogy earlier that said within a population of 10,000 people, you're going to have a certain percentage of different types of people. Bob said, we are working our way around our police department just as fast as we can, and dealing with rapes and homicides and drugs and terrorism and all the other things that happen in a city of this size and, and location and with the assets that we have. So, you know, I believe we are throwing all the assets that are available to us. We're, work, we've been engage, we're engaging the federal government in this effort. We're engaging the state in this effort. The county's been engaged in this effort. We're a nonprofit and faith-based community. I mean, we're doing it. We're doing everything that we can do, and we're not going to stop. We're going to keep, you know, working it as the issues and barriers pop up. Uh, but I could quote you just as many uh, negative experiences, and it's usually not even me, with, with, <laughs> with wow. uh, police officers in my, in my, my lifetime. Sorry. But I've also <laughs> seen unbelievable heroics and unbelievable dedication and caring. So, you know, and I guess as a, as a, a person who's very vested in this community and not in law enforcement, although I have great respect for them, I take exception as a as a as a, a city of, not just a city of Anaheim person, but as a person who grew up here. I take exception to a sweeping condemnation of our city because we don't seem to be doing anything when we seem to be doing a great deal. Well, who, well, who, who made a sweeping condemnation? Well, well uh, I think I don't know why this started because well I before you. But you made, <laughs> Matt made an interesting point. Yeah. You came into this pretty late in the game. But the point is, I didn't make a sweeping condemnation of everybody in the room or the whole city. I never did that. I so didn't say you either. Okay, well, I said, I'm talking about the people that have come before the council yeah. for the last two years, three years, yeah. and said, you guys aren't doing anything. And quite frankly, looking back three years ago, we probably weren't doing this this year. We're doing a lot now. So, I, you know, the purpose of this meeting was to, uh, because you and the mayor had a conversation during the council meeting, and we said, well, I'd like to have a meeting and know about what you guys are doing. That's what this is. And that's well, what we've well, 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 actually more about... Uh, dealing with a workshop regarding the police and how they're approaching the homeless because sometimes that's what more like what I said really more than so much tell me what you all are doing but I'm glad that I heard that and that's not a bad thing but I really really what I, I was at requesting was a, regarding a workshop on, on you know maybe teaching some of the police that aren't you know so, so much uh, up to par as far as how they're dealing with the homeless like have a workshop for them so that they know when they approach them not to treat them all the same or to dehumanize them or say you gotta get out of the park at 7 p.m. when the park is open, um, you know, and, and, and to, to be a little more sensitive, you know, and when you walk into a group of people that maybe some are druggies, some are not, you know, some are just you know, out of their luck, you know, that, that, that was more what it was about. But I'm glad to hear what y'all are doing. And I thought it's already new because I've been working with George Creation, who unfortunately isn't able to, to help at this time. But I've been working with him and, and, and uh, Officer Conklin and others trying to help people get housing, that kind of stuff. Awesome. Yeah, so that's I, what we need you to do. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, I've been doing that. Yeah, and, and I have to be, I've been trying to contact George for a while, but uh, he, he's not, he wasn't available because like, I keep getting people coming and saying, hey, I need housing, I need this. A woman on the street with her kid, I need somewhere to go, and I'm trying to you know, make something happen, and, and I don't have no, no way to make it happen. You know, I, I lost yeah. my contact. You have ways to help. Yeah, well, I mean, we need to connect you to whatever yeah. we can do to be that conduit. Yeah, to connect you with that. Yeah, and I've got multiple phone numbers and, and, and tried to make things happen, and, and still I see people out there, so I'm like, you know, still still kind of bad at that issue. But you know, that, that that was kind of more what it was about. But I'm glad still to meet everybody, have everyone meet together and talk about this stuff because um, I think it's really productive. Well, and, and I believe, well, I and I believe the effort is happening. What you're yeah. asking for, which is that's to what I was just saying. educate the, the police officer on the line about the issue rather than only having specialized. I really feel uncomfortable speaking. Well, you know, but, you're, but, you're but, you're but, but, but it, you know, it does take time when you sure. work 24 hours a day yeah. to get through 350 people and get them trained on this but issue. But I think it's important it's to happened. understand, council workshops are only to update on programs. It's not to have a training session for the police department. That is controlled by the city manager who works with the police chief. So you're not gonna have a workshop on training police officers. Council workshops are to give you updates on programs, which they've already done in quite a few on the homeless. Yeah, they've done general. three workshops. So on you have to understand, this is in lieu of the workshop of getting the education 
information out and the contacts for you, but we're not going to have a workshop on training the officers of this department. Yeah, that's just... No, we have done some training. We'll, we'll, get, we'll continue to look for other training opportunities. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, I'd like to say every officer is perfect in their contact and their learning. That's not even, you know, that's not true. So while some officers are not maybe professional contacting the homeless, some officers aren't professional contacting you and me mm -hmm. on the street. And you know what I mean? So it, it, we're constantly working on that. I mean, we, we sent everybody through a customer service class a few years ago. We had to deal with people. So, you know, and we remind, you know, probably about two years ago, there's a big push in the whole department. Hey, it's not against the law to be homeless. Because what we have to do is we have to educate our officers because we have to educate the community. So the homeowners are calling about, hey, this homeless guy sleep. It's not against the law to be homeless. You could be homeless in the park during the day. Right. You know, you know, with, yeah. with, with, you know, so we're getting there. We're, it's really not, not everybody's perfect. And sure. in yeah. contact, That's not good. just the homeless. I want them to contact everybody professionally, with sure. empathy, yeah. but, you know, doing their job. Sure. That's my goal. So I think, you know, if, if your goal was to, to, to have the police department move in a direction of greater sensitivity on this issue, I believe that that is in, in progress. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, you know, and again, many, many resources are being dedicated to this issue. And I, and I would stack that up for, on a per capita basis to any other city in this county. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll second that because we, yeah. we work with a number of police departments. And in our experience, and not, not every police department in Southern California, but a number of them, and in our experience, um, the APDs are at the, at the top of the list in terms of um, sensitivity and, and willingness to embrace this issue in ways beyond just trying to arrest themselves out of that. I'd also say the city has more than any other city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that too. More, more than any other city I've ever worked with. Yeah, in fact, on our next training, HLOs are bringing in um, park rangers and public works staff that are going to be also trained because they also are running into either transients in the alleys for public work staff that need to pick up stuff or even the park rangers. So we're expanding our outreach to even people that may not have direct contact with them as much as we do, but city, more field personnel is going to be better. You know, I have every homeless person that I talk to in the city in the last almost two years now wandering around talking to people in parks, which I do on a regular, I don't do it on a daily basis anymore, but certainly weekly a couple of times a week. One of the first questions I always, once I have to convince them that I'm not a cop, you know, they can, I, well, I look like a cop kind of, I guess. You just look shady. I'm way too old for that. I, I'm too old That's why he gets frisked so often. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I'd be retired nine years ago if I were a cop. But, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, is that the first question I ask is, tell me about your encounters with city staff. I show them my business card, I show them I'm not a police officer, I work for community services, I'm a parks guy, and, I'm, and it really, most of the time, the people I talk to say, well, you know, a couple of years ago it was pretty negative, but lately it just seems like I feel safer now. I feel like I know the police by name, and, and, and if I've got a problem, I, I have somebody to go to. That is a huge paradigm mm -hmm. shift, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I specifically ask about the park ranger program because that that's my program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mean, I really look at that as mine. And they say no, the rangers are, are always very polite, and, mm -hmm. and they just tell us what the rules are, and we try not to give them a hard time. Converse. Now on the other side of that, I have park maintenance workers stuck with needles that are are looking at at, at a horrible potential in their future as a result of that. Um, we do we do all the training in the world to try and keep that from happening, but sometimes people get stuck with needles, and they get stashed in places, and when these guys go, you know, so we ask Mercy House, you know, please, when you're talking to people, the ones that you know that, that, that have this problem, please, you know, we've got needle disposal units all over the place that they can use. Don't stick them in toilet pa piles of toilet paper and put them in a the trash can. You know, I mean, can you imagine having to, you know, go home and tell your wife, I got stuck with a needle at work today, and then I got to go to the doctor and see if I have AIDS or hepatitis or some other horrible thing? I mean, these guys are making, you know, eight bucks an hour, ten bucks an hour to clean a bathroom, and they're faced with this horrible, this horror. So, you know, as Nathan said, we have to kind of represent those who don't have a voice, yeah, and, and that includes people other than homeless people. Yeah, I'm not saying not to. I'm definitely, I can already say. But join us, and you have. And, and you heard from, you know, I know that you've talked with Brad, I know that you've talked with Bob and with Matt. I think that's wonderful. Please.